like it? Okay, let's see. Sun's a setting. This is what I'm gonna sing. Sun's a setting. This is what I'm gonna sing. I feel the blues a coming. Wonder what the blues will bring. Hmm. What, what was it, Doggy? Oh! <laughs> I was just reading some poetry with um, Doggy. Doggy really loves poetry. This was a great poem by Langston Hughes. You know what? Langston Hughes was a really important part of the Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance is an important and amazing part of American history for literature, music, art, and theater. I've got a surprise for you. Imagine, it's the year 1920, Harlem, New York. You know what? Wait one second. I think we need a little bit of a transformation. Transformation complete. 1920s, New York City. It's the bee's knees. From 1918, to the mid to late 1930s, an explosion of African-American literature and art happened and it spread across America, but there was no place greater than Harlem where the Renaissance was happening. Renaissance, a birth or revival of art and literature. And the African-American community in Harlem was doing just that. They were revitalizing poetry and music and dance and theater. Some of the most amazing writers that we know came from the Harlem Renaissance. And we're gonna talk about them. But today, I wanna to read a story to you. And that story is Harlem's Little Blackbird. The story of Florence Mills. Words by Renee Watson, pictures by Christian Robinson. Now Florence was a singer in the era of the Harlem Renaissance. I want to share this story with you, and I want you to think about the things that Florence Mills had to face in order to be the singer. Harlem's Little Blackbird. Words by Renee Watson, pictures by Christian Robinson. And here's the dedication. Renee Watson dedicates this for Harlem, past, present, future. And Christian Robinson dedicates the book to For Gaga. Happy 101st birthday. Wow, go Gaga. They called her Harlem's Little Blackbird. Her name was Florence Mills. She was born in 1896 and lived in a teeny tiny itsy bitsy house in Washington DC. A house so fragile, it would shake whenever a thunderstorm came. Mother said, don't fear and she would sway back and forth to the rain's rhythm, singing the same spirituals that had carried her family through slavery's storms. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Mother's voice wrapped Florence like a warm blanket. Florence started singing too. The louder the thunder roared, the stronger she sang. Soon the storm faded to a damp drizzle. And when the drizzle disappeared, her voice had chased the storm away. Florence thought, if my voice is powerful enough to stop the rain, what else can it do? It wasn't long before Florence found out. On the playground at school, she would sing and dance. Her friends would stop playing just to listen. Whenever music would play, Florence's hand got to waving. Her hips got to shaking and her feet strutted and glided across the pavement. The cakewalk is what they called it. Everyone was cakewalking, but Florence did it best. Her feet were like wings fluttering in the air. Soon Florence was cakewalking and singing in contests all over town. She won many medals. Florence had a hard time paying attention in school. Instead of listening to the teacher, she would stare out the window. The sky became her stage, and she was a star singing and dancing for the world. But wishing couldn't change the fact that she was just Florence Mills, 
but daughter of former slaves, living in a teeny, tiny, itsy, bitsy house. Word danced around Washington about the little girl with big talent. Florence was invited to perform at a fancy theater. The night before the show, she practiced her routine over and over. On the day of the show, when Florence and her friends arrived at the theater, nothing was what Florence had dreamed it would be. They can't come in, the manager said. He pointed to the sign that read, whites only. No Negroes in the audience. Florence used her voice to stand up for what was right. If they can't go in there, I'm staying out here, Florence said. And with her hands on her hips and her head held high, she walked away. Wait, the manager yelled, but Florence kept walking. He begged her to perform and snuck her friends in to see the show. That night, Florence performed her best routine. Everyone stood and clapped. Less than six years later, her family moved to New York City. Florence and her sisters became a singing and dancing trio, the Mills Sisters. They performed at Harlem's Lincoln Theater. In the summer, the Mills Sisters spent their days at Coney Island. Florence never got tired of going on the rides and playing games at the arcades, but nothing was as fun as performing at the Surf Avenue Opera House. Reporters followed them everywhere, and there was one sister they adored the most, 16-year-old Florence. Come hear the woman who sings like a bird. When she dances, it's as if she's flying. And she was. She flew from stage to stage all over the country, from the East Coast to the West Coast, until she landed at New York's 63rd Street Music Hall. It was 1921, and Florence won a role in Shuffle Along, the sold-out show introduced jazz to white audiences. Each night, Florence gave her best. Every part of her body danced. Her eyelashes fluttered, her fingers wiggled. She whirled around and boogied down. Night after night, she gave the audience a hand-clapping, foot-stomping good time. A very special thing was happening in Harlem, the Harlem Renaissance. All kinds of creative minds contributed to Harlem's cultural movement. Langston Hughes penned poetry. Duke Ellington composed jazz classics. And in play after play, Florence continued to mesmerize crowds. In From Dover Street to Dixie, she was so good, the cast was invited to London. Florence was excited to travel overseas. But not everyone welcomed her. When she boarded the ship, the white passengers refused to eat in the same dining hall as Florence and her troupe. When she arrived in London, many people threatened to boycott the show because they didn't want to see black performers on their stage. On opening night, Florence took a deep breath opened her mouth and sang one note, then another and another. The audience was amazed. Each night when Florence stepped on stage, the audience cheered before she even opened her mouth. She was an international star. And Florence thought, if my voice can take me around the world, what else can it do? After Florence sailed back to Harlem, Mr. Zegfield, an important Broadway manager, offered Florence a leading role. She would have been the first black woman to star in the Zegfield Follies. It was every performer's dream, but she turned it down. Instead, she chose to use her voice in shows that gave unknown black singers and actors a chance to perform on stage. Florence became the leading lady in Dixie to Broadway. 100 lights shined on the marquee flashing her name. The daughter of former slaves who grew up in a teeny tiny itsy bitsy house had made it. Florence wanted to use her voice for more than entertainment. In the show Blackbirds, she sang, I'm a little blackbird looking for a bluebird. 
It became her favorite song to perform, a cry for equal rights. Though I'm a darker hue, I have a heart the same as you. For love I'm dying, my heart is crying. A wise old owl said, keep on trying. I'm a little blackbird looking for a bluebird too. The show was such a hit that Florence was invited to London again. This time she was welcomed by photographers and news reporters and she was invited to many parties. After her performances, Florence disguised herself so no one would recognize her. She went to hospitals to deliver flowers to patients and she walked along the Thames River giving money and food to beggars. Florence kept giving and dancing and singing until she was too exhausted to perform anymore. She became very ill and returned to Harlem to receive treatment from her doctor. But there was not much for her that the doctor could do. On November 1st, 1927, Florence's song came to an end. More than 150,000 mourners flooded the streets of Harlem to say goodbye. Letters, telegrams, and flowers were sent to the family from all over the world. People who had a lot and people who had a little, politicians and entertainers, whites and blacks, gave tribute to Florence Mills. Even blackbirds came. Hundreds of them were seen hovering nearby. Florence's dream lives on in the singers and dancers who came after her. It lives on in the heart of every boy and girl from a teeny tiny itsy bitsy place who dreams of doing great, big, gigantic, enormous things. So in today's book, Harlem's Little Blackbird, there were some really cool questions that the book asked. Let's see, I'm going to turn to the page where the first one happens. So in the beginning of the story, Florence is with her mother and there's a rainstorm. And Florence thinks to herself, if my voice is powerful enough to stop the rain, what else can it do? I think that is a great question. And it's a very inspiring question for writers. So for today's writing activity, we're gonna do a free write, which is very similar to our stream of conscious writing which is when I give you one word and you write about it nonstop. But we're gonna do a free write about this question. If my voice is powerful enough to stop the rain, what else can it do? This is a great question for a writer. And I'll tell you why. Because you can think of it in a very realistic sense, like Florence. She believed when she was a little girl that the singing with her mother could really stop the rain. And when you're little and you think you can stop the rain, you almost think that you have magic powers. And in a way, Florence did have magic powers because she grew up to, grow, to be this extraordinary performer and great person. So if we think about this, if your voice could stop the rain, if you had the magic power of your voice stopping rain, what kind of character might you be? I want you to do a free write. If my voice can stop the rain, what else can it do? And I want you to think about that question. And then I want you to write about it. And I'm going to put our timer on for one minute. And during that one minute while you're writing, I think I'm going to keep doing the Charleston. <laughs>
So as we saw in this book, Florence and her friends weren't allowed to be in the theater. It was a theater for white people only. And that's a really sad part of our history, that there was a time where black people were not allowed to be in the audience or perform on American stages. But it was people like Florence who stood up and said something that made a difference. And what's remarkable about a woman like Florence Mills is not only was she an amazing performer who loved to share her talent, share her voice, sing and dance, she was also a really good person. And she stood up for what she believed in. I think it's amazing that Florence would take the time when she was traveling the world performing, that she would take the time to go out and visit people in the hospital and try to bring joy to people who were sick and suffering. But it's important to remember people like Florence who were remarkable, but also came from a very tiny house. Her parents were former slaves. She did amazing, extraordinary things. So no matter who we are, no matter how small we might feel sometimes, we can do really big, extraordinary things, just like Florence. Thank you so much for joining me and Doggy today on Playing With a Purpose. We had a great time talking about the Harlem Renaissance with you and Florence Mills. Hmm. Oh, sorry, I just started dreaming again. Thank you so much for joining us on Playing With a Purpose, presented by Lake Erie, Inc. You can check out Lake Erie, Inc. and other writing programs at www.lakeerieinc.org. Thanks for coming by. Bye! Woo, woo, woo.